Hi, everybody. Um, good evening and welcome to a Lemons Legacies Porch Talk. Tonight, um, we have our very own Dr. Jawan Johnson, who is the Lemon Project Mellon postdoc. He started with us this past August, and a large part of his um, responsibilities with this position is to do um, genealogical work um, and to do these types of workshops. And so we're so glad that there was such a great interest um, in this. Um, but tonight he's going to be talking about finding my people, African American genealogy. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to Dr. Johnson and let him take over. Thank you again for being here. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen, for that warm introduction. Um, so excited to see everyone tonight. So excited to see so many wonderful, wonderful faces. I've been waiting to talk to you all for a while. So I'm glad you showed up. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Jawan Johnson. I'm a social historian of African-American life history and culture. Um, and I'm excited that you all have joined us for what is a first installment of a series of genealogical research, genealogy workshops that will be hosted by the Lemon Project. Um, our genealogy initiative is really to is focus on documenting the lives of those who were enslaved uh, by William and Mary and to discover linkages to descendants. Um, and to do this, we are collaborating with local and surrounding communities to really tell a fuller narrative of the African American experience, African American life history and culture in the Tidewater area. And tonight we have some of our wonderful community partners who are co partnering with this workshop. And that is the Let Freedom Ring Foundation at First Baptist Church in Williamsburg, as well as the Williamsburg Public Library, Regional Library for this porch talk. I also, before I really get started, I want to congratulate um, First Baptist Church, um, particularly the, the um, Let Freedom Ring Foundation on the Today's Show feature that I saw this week. You can check out the story on Google. It was wonderful to learn more about um, the church, the people, and the wonderful work that they're doing um, in, in terms of archaeology and unearthing the stories that are embedded in that particular space. So again, congratulations. I also, I want to make a note that this uh, workshop, I want it to be uh, a bit interactive. And so there'll be times where I would encourage you to use the chat feature. Um, I also have a Jamboard activity as well as a survey. I want to know a bit more about you that will, you know, that will actually help us actually plan more genealogy um, workshops and activities. Um, so I encourage you just to relax, get your beverage, your favorite snack, and just enjoy this, enjoy this time. Um, and before we kind of get started, I want to also kind of get familiar with who's in the audience. So um, I'm gonna ask if you're a William and Mary um, student, faculty or staff, I'm gonna ask you to put uh, WM in the chat. Okay. Awesome. I see William and Mary is representing. And if you're a, um, a member of First Baptist Church, I want you to type First Baptist in the chat room. Okay. I see Juanita Graham, Melvin Abram. Thank you all for joining us. And um, my colleague, Sarah Thomas, is going to put a, um, a link in the in the chat, uh, which is a survey, because I want to know if you're new to genealogy, if you're at an intermediate level, or if you are in advance. We kind of have a mix in the room tonight. Most of this workshop will be at the kind of the beginner's level, um, but there's something that I think everyone can kind of gain from this research, um, from this workshop. As, men, as mentioned, it's the first of a genealogy research series. Um, where we plan to uh, provide you as many resources as possible to start your research, to further develop your research. And so there'll be some questions that I may not get to tonight, but we will have other workshops where you are actually, those questions may be answered. And we're actually having a workshop that's coming up in April. And it's going to be a fascinating workshop. And I'll tell you more about that at the end. So I encourage you to, 
to stay in there with us um, so you can learn about that information. And at this time, I'm going to pull up my slide and we're going to delve a little deeper here. Bear with me one moment. Okay. All righty. <clears throat> so the topic of tonight is called Finding My People, an Introduction to African-American Genealogy Research. And um, the topic, I, I arrived at this topic, uh, Finding My People, African-American Genealogy Research, as I really began to kind of reflect on an epiphany I had some years ago when I initially started genealogy research, um, primarily when I was working at Central Arkansas Library System as an oral historian in, in the Genealogy Research, Arkansas History and Genealogy Research Center. Um, and I had a, an epiphany, epiphany that um, I realized that Black people, particularly in America, we have been seeking a connection with our people um, since the moment we arrived on these shores, that there has never been a moment in our existence where we were in some way trying to connect with our kin. Um, our biological and also our non-biological um, family. And so because of this brutal institution of slavery and its far reaching tentacles uh, bequeathed us with the often difficult task of trying to restore familiar connections. And so I think this presentation is really timely, uh, particularly with this year's uh, black history theme that's set by the Association for the Study of African-American Life and Culture. And the theme this year is called the black family representation, identity, diversity. Um, and I think this is like I said, a very timely theme um, for our workshop this evening. So throughout the presentation, I'll be really impressing upon us that as we observe um, this Black History Month theme to really delve deeper into our family and community history. The picture you see is my great, great grandfather. And this is really my genealogy search started with him. His name is Linton Tate or was Linton Tate. Um, and my re as I mentioned, my research really started with him. And this photo consistently teaches me about the profound lessons about the Black family, our unity, the love, the nurture, our tragedies and triumphs. And for me, this photo also represents the best of, of who we are. Um, and it also motivates me in my research um, and also motivates me more generally in life. And so I encourage you that as you move forward in your genealogy research, to find that photo, to find that document, whatever that kind of keeps you motivated, um, not only in your research, but also in life in general. And so you'll hear more about him later because he's really gonna be the focus um, of, of some of the case studies that I present as I discuss where we're headed in terms of our research. Okay. So what are our objectives for tonight? So as mentioned, this is kind of an introduction, um, but I think there'll be lessons that everyone can glean from. Um, so we're going to learn how to get started in genealogy. Um, I'm also going to hope to really get you motivated about, about your research and also provide several resources that I think that will be helpful um, in your geneolo genealogy research. And so why do we do genealogy research? Of course, there are many reasons why we, why we do research. Many of you um, who've come to this workshop tonight, you have reasons that may align with some of these that I've listed. Um, but there's no wrong answer here. Um, we want answers to uh, what's historically concealed. We want family connections, known and unknown. We sometimes want to uh, dismantle myths and untruths, trace land ownerships. We also desire a connection to our ancestors and we want to preserve family traditions. So in terms of the challenges in African-American genealogy research, which there are specific challenges, um, I encourage, I, I would like to actually hear from you before I actually post the slide. What do you think some of the challenges are in African-American genealogy research? I encourage you just to take a couple of moments just to kind of list some, and then I'll go over my list with you. And maybe a particular challenge that you have been having that we can kind of discuss um, as we move forward in this series of workshops. Okay. 
Well, I'll give you a list of, of some here that I have identified. Uh, one would be access to records, access to information. Of course, we're in a pandemic at this moment. So um, oftentimes it is really kind of difficult to do research in repositories and in libraries due to um, COVID restrictions. So that is an access issue. Also, um, research can be expensive in some cases. Um, and so access also becomes an issue. Also, there are assumptions. Sometimes we assume that information is just not there. I'm not gonna find anything about my family. That was really how I approached genealogy when I first started. Um, I just assumed that I wouldn't find anything. And, uh, but as you will learn as this uh, workshop progresses, I actually, I actually found quite a bit. Um, sometimes there are no records. Also, there's withheld information. There's inaccuracies. Um, emotionally triggering. African-American genealogy research can be emotionally triggering, particularly when you discover information about your ancestors, such as the, their enslavement um, and other um, stories of brutality. And so it can be a very um, emotionally triggering process. But I don't like to talk about the challenges without mentioning the unique opportunities in African-American uh, genealogy research. I find it to be empowering. Uh, when I read the stories of, of my ancestors and I research their lives in these records, um, I, I complain a lot less because I recognize that these are people who have survived very critical times. And during these moments, they were making and they were remaking their lives in very harsh circumstances and situations. And those are the lessons that we, that we definitely should pass on to future generations. Um, you also discovered your shared experiences with your ancestors. We discover that we, uh, we often find ourselves in those um, who have uh, in our ancestors. So I consistently uh, come across records where I actually learn that I had maybe some common interest with my, uh, with my ancestors. Also, you're contributing to local, state, and regional history. It's also an opportunity to tighten family bonds. And it's also reparative, uh, writing people into history who were erased. Um, and it's an opportunity, in many cases, to learn about family medical history. So there are so many benefits um, to African-American genealogy that I think outweigh many of the challenges. So getting started. So initially in any research project, you want to know, you want to decide or think about what you want to discover. And so I encourage you, there's a, a link that's being placed in the chat. Um, that's a Jamboard. Um, and I encourage you to click on that link. You should have access to it. And I wanna hear from you. I wanna know what do you want to discover in your genealogy research. And this will be helpful to me, particularly as we plan out future genealogy uh, workshops. So that's the first question. What do you want to discover? My question, um, when I approached gene genealogy research was who is my great great grandfather whom you saw in the photo because I want I heard much about his life I heard about our ties to Arkansas but I, I didn't have much information and I really wanted to delve in I heard many wonderful stories that had been passed down about his life and um, I was living in Arkansas at the time and so I really wanted to know more about the ties in Arkansas and particularly about his life and so I did, um, I started local, I started with what I had. And in this process, I encourage you to number one, start with personal or family archives. Um, start with what you have. Also record your story. Um, you're an archive, you have memories, you have ideas, you have uh, thoughts of uh, memories about your community. So I encourage you to document those stories, record yourself with your iPhone. You can buy a recorder from, from Walmart, um, that's easy to do. and also from there, begin to interview your relatives. This is an opportune time to do that via Zoom, um, to have family reunions online. Um, I encourage you to also collect and organize rare, um, rare documents and photos. Begin to kind of build your own archive and, and tap into what you already have in your home. You can also um, determine if there is a family genealogy, a genealogist. Uh, throughout my process, I did discover that there was someone in the family already uh, who had started the research, and I was able to pick up in places where she left off. Also, this is a time to begin to develop your pedigree chart. So in terms of how I got started, 
um, I got started with writing a personal narrative and wrote personal, a personal narrative about myself. And then I also began to develop bios about my immediate family members because genealogy research, it starts with you. Um, also, as mentioned, I conducted family inter uh, uh, interviews, oral history interviews with family members at the family reunion, which is a photo that you see here of some of the elders in my family. Um, at this family reunion, I discovered the family genealogist who was willing to share information that she had been collecting for many, many years. Um, also, uh, the relatives engaged in story, st in story sharing. Um, this was a chance for us to kind of trade family stories in a more informal way, as we typically do in African American uh, culture. And so um, this is kind of the results of some of the things that I found in my own personal and family archives, and you may have this information in your home as well. Um, I discovered a family history book with multiple family lines, uh, photos of multiple generations, there were written stories, there was correspondence inviting people um, to submit um, family history information. Um, there was also a research plan and that I further developed. And so you never know what's around your house. You never know what other relatives may have. So it's a good time to convene those within the family just to see um, what is there and to also and to kind of start from at that place. Dr. Johnson? Yes. I, I just wanted to let you know that the Jam Board is view only. Okay. Is it possible to change that? I'll tell you what we can do. Um, how about we just use the chat? You can write your responses into the chat. I'll save the chat, um, and then um, we can we can do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So just enter that in, into the chat room, and that'll kind of serve as an archive for us for, to uh, to visit later, and to to kind of get some ideas in terms of what you um, what you're interested in researching. So number three, um, let me go back. I think I. Okay. So number three was to develop your research plan. Um, determine what go what are your goals? What again, what do you want to know? And then reviewing what you already know. You may already have a lot of information. And as I just showed you earlier, I didn't realize really what I what I had in my home and what was at my uh, what was available to me from family members. But this was a wonderful opportunity. This is a time for you to kind of assess what you already know. Uh, determine how many generations will be researched, whether it's the maternal or paternal line, and to become familiar uh, with the records pertaining to period you're researching. Uh, one of the initial steps really is to understand um, the records, what's, what's available. And that's been my approach, even in doing research uh, with the Lemon Project um, in, in trying to find those who are enslaved by, uh, who were enslaved by William and Mary. Um, it's first important to understand um, the records that are available, what sources are available here in Virginia. My expertise was primarily in Arkansas. So one of the first steps that I do is I wanna get familiar with the information locally, statewide, um, all manner of archival information that may aid in my, in my research process. And as mentioned, it is a process and it's not what you see on television. <laughs> um, it's not always that easy and not always that glamorous because there are also be barriers in the research process. Um, and I have a, a, a photo of a, uh, of a maze, and that's kind of how I see the research process, that um, you oftentimes have barriers, you hit brick walls, but you just kind of keep on moving. And every one of those barriers is really an opportunity to kind of learn, to step back and to reassess, uh, to learn something new in terms of the records. And uh, hopefully you'll, you'll get to that, to that goal. But um, I'm always, I never shirk away from the challenges because there will be challenges as we have noted, but uh, that's the time to really assess and to identify records that may be of assistance, identify organizations and people who may be able to assist you in breaking that, whatever that barrier may be. And number four, we want to get organized. Um, you're developing a story about your family. And so it's important to develop a timeline um, to keep information in order. So you want to create a filing, filing system. However you do that there, you can actually, um, you can create one in ancestry.com. They have capabilities where you can actually house some of your records. You can um, create one with paper, however you choose, however you best organize. And I also encourage people to share their work, to share it with other relatives, to work within organizations um, such as the Afro 
American Historical and Genealogical Society, a wonderful group that I'm a member of here in Virginia, um, to collaborate with groups who are doing genealogy research who may be able to help you throughout that process. Okay. So these are, few, these are just a few tips on family pedigree charts. Um, I encourage you to, um, to start with a paper pedigree chart. And um, that's pretty much how I get started. Also, I encourage you to go as far back as you possibly can based on your knowledge, to work on one family unit at a time, um, to use the tree um, to set research priorities, and also um, include other family members in the process as they may be able to fill in some of the blanks and have information that, um, that you may not know. So now that we know what we want to discover, we've mined our personal um, and family records, we have a research plan and we're organized. So we, it's time to dive into the records. And so I'm gonna break this up into two parts, pre and post civil war uh, genealogy resources. And I'm gonna really focus more on the pre-Civil War, pre-Civil War resources and kind of delve a little bit into the post, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna focus more on the post-Civil War uh, genealogical resources, but I'm gonna also kind of delve a little bit into uh, pre-Civil War because I wanna take some time to share what I, some of the things that I've been finding um, in terms of those who were enslaved by William and Mary. So here are a list of some sources. Um, of course, we have federal census reports that start for African Americans. We're listed in the reports in 1870 um, by name, first and last name. We have county, state, and city histories. We have vital records. Um, they start a little bit later in the state of Virginia, about 1912 um, statewide um, vital records are kept. We also have military records, draft registration cards, military pensions, Freeman Bureau records, which I'll have a specific case study about because this is a wonderful resource. Um, obituaries that are available on family research, on family search, particularly for the state of Virginia. There is a wonderful uh, collection of, of resources of, of obituaries there. Family Bibles, church records, oral histories, historic black newspapers are rich source of information in just understanding more about um, your ancestors and more about their communities where they may have lived. Also, I encourage the, the use of yearbooks um, of historic African-American schools. This has served as a wonderful resource for me as I research um, not only my family, but also community members. Um, my research really kind of started with the 19 census report, 1930 census report, and this is an example of that. I usually um, start out wanting to um, see all of the dem demographic information and clearly understand uh, what's in the report. So I usually review this, this, the census uh, form before I actually delve into it as just a way of educating myself about the report. And these are some tips on using the census, uh, federal census report. Um, it started, of course, 1790 and 1940. Um, the 1890 census is unavailable. It was destroyed. Um, African Americans appear by name in 1870. In terms of, uh, as it relates to the census report, I encourage um, people to pay attention to all of the demographic information, everything that is listed, to really pay attention as this tells a, a full story about your ancestors. Look for variations in names, ages, and family constructs because they change over time. Also to pay attention to the neighbors, who's around your relatives, um, and understand that there will be inaccuracies. I found several inaccuracies in various uh, in, in reports that pertain to my uh, family research. Also, the census report forms are available on, on the census.gov, or you can do a Google search and you can find the form for the particular year that you're looking for. But mine started with 1930, where I found my great-great-grandfather, Linton Tate, whom I've introduced earlier, in the census records of 1930 in Pasacola Township in Missouri. And um, so this was a breakthrough for me, because again, I went with the idea that nothing was there, but he was there in the 1930 census report. And I discovered that he was there with his wife and 10 children. Um, he had twin daughters, and I particularly paid attention to that because I see that there are twins as I look at earlier census reports of his grandfather, I see that there's also a set of twins in the family. 
I'm paying close attention to the names and how the names repeat. Um, I see that he's on this in this township as a farmer and it states that his birthplace was Arkansas. And my question was where in Arkansas? And so I had to turn at that time to his only living child, um, my great, great aunt, who gave me the information as to the town. And this really opened up the floodgates of my research. So I encourage you all to, to although oral history can sometimes be a little sketchy, but it's also a vital source and it's an important source. So I encourage you to, to use oral history as it can be very instrumental in removing the roadblocks in your research. And in this, in my case, it did. And I discovered where they were actually from in Arkansas through this oral history interview with my great, great aunt Inez. And I was able to go even deeper in my genealogy research. And as a resource, I encourage you to um, check out the oralhistory.org. This is a site that provides you uh, guidelines for actually doing oral history interviews. It also provides some ethical guidelines. And there's a wonderful book called Practices in Oral History. And it's oral history for the family historian. And so there'll be many um, tips in there that will help you actually conduct really good oral history interviews. But I discovered the name of the town and eventually I went to the town and I would encourage you as well that if you have the opportunity to visit um, your, um, the place where your ancestors resided, I encourage you to, to do that. And I discovered quite a bit about uh, my family as I actually visited that city. And I discovered that some of the relatives were still there. Not everyone leaves. You'll be surprised that there may be relatives in that area. Um, and also maps. Maps were really, really critical because as I move earlier into the census report, I see that some relatives are listed in Missouri Township. And so I use local uh, county records um, to actually see if the, if the county lines had changed um, because that, that does happen. But I wanted to particularly know if this town was in proximity to where my great great grandfather uh, was residing. And I see that there is some close proximity there. In, in terms of maps, I would encourage you to use uh, mapofus.org. This is a wonderful tool um, that is very useful and has proven to be very useful for me, particularly when I'm doing slave era research because state lines change. And this is something to really understand when you're trying to do research on ancestors and to understand where they could have been located, where they were or were not located because county lines change, state lines change. County histories are very, very important. Uh, visit your local libraries. We have a part of, um, also the state library is very, very important. A good source of information for city and county histories. Also, I know some people may not be able to visit the library, but they have wonderful online sources. Of course, I used Encyclopedia of Arkansas History and Culture, which gave me some historical information about uh, the town of Bern. And I learned a lot of information on this site that really helped me to better understand uh, my ancestors and their life. Um, I see that there was a decline in the timber industry, which could have explained that many people probably migrated as a result of that decline, because I'm quite sure they were, there was job loss. Um, and so there's a lot of information that is embedded um, on these uh, county and, and city histories that may be helpful into understanding the broader context and the social history uh, that relates to your family in a particular area. Local newspapers are also a, a, a really good source uh, when it comes to discovering more information about your family. And the Library of I mean, Virginia has some wonderful sources as well. Uh, there is a Encyclopedia Virginia, which is a great source that I have used uh, to learn more about um, towns and learn more about uh, people who would, could have been connected, uh, who could have been enslavers. I also, um, the Library of Virginia also has a very robust list of historical and genealogical societies in Virginia. And this is particularly uh, very helpful if you are looking to delve more uh, deeply into the local history of a particular area. Okay. And so I was able to get to the 1910 census based again on that oral history interview. And in this particular census, 
um, something really stood out to me. And what stood out to me was that my great great grandfather worked on the railroad. So of course, census reports also have occupations and industries on this 1910 census. And I can see that he's working on the railroad. And this is helpful for me because it really confirmed what some information that I was given by a, a distant relative who still lived in the city of Bern, Arkansas. And she mentioned to me that many of the, um, the men, the Tate men, as she called them, worked for the railroad. And so when I saw this uh, in the census report, it really confirmed um, like so what she said. So I encourage you again to visit those places where your ancestors um, lived, um, get information as to what was going on in terms of the, the industry, the history of that area, um, because it could really be helpful as you, as you continue to build this narrative about your family. And so I move forward and I am able to move forward into the, uh, the 1900 uh, census report. And so the story continues and I find Linton Tate and he is with his parents. And uh, so he is, uh, his father is also, um, he's with his father, Colfer Tate and Martha. And so this was really helpful to me in moving that even further. And I'm noticing that names are repeating. As I mentioned earlier, that in the census reports, you will find that in families, names often repeat. And I'm seeing this, these recurring names. I'm seeing that he named his daughter, one of his daughters, after his mom, Martha. And so you may notice that as you begin to delve into the census reports as well. And I have a breakthrough in that I made it to the 1870. This is one of the goals uh, that many people have is that they have made it, that they want to make it to the 1870 census, particularly as it relates to African-American um, genealogy research. This is the, a major accomplishment. And I find that Linton Tate is, um, I find his grandfather, Ned Tate, who was born in 1835, his father is listed in this report. Um, and as I delve a little deeper, um, and I won't get into this tonight, I also find a potential enslaver. And so this is a bit of information about the 1870 census. This is kind of a breakdown. This was the first census uh, since slavery was abolished and it has surnames. Um, it shows marital status, voter eligibility. Also it shows infirmities. And I began to pay particularly close attention to, uh, to this um, area of the census report as I begin to try to understand more about the medical history of my family. Another uh, very good resource um, that I have really been delving into recently, particularly with a group that was established by, um, by my good friend at UVA, uh, Dr. Shelley Murphy. We meet every Friday for Freedman Bureau Fridays to really delve into these records. Um, and the Freedman Bureau, it was established uh, by the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen uh, and Abandoned Lands in 1865. And I'm quite sure many of you use these records and understand um, the, the robust information that's there. Um, but this report was, um, this particular bureau was purposed to aid formerly enslaved persons uh, transition to freedom and citizenship. And it provided assistance uh, for millions of enslaved and also impoverished Southern whites. And there were many services that it offered from clothing to medical care um, to help legalize marriages. And this is uh, a place where I have begun to find a lot of good information in terms of the marriage reports. Um, this is the National Archives and Records website. This is a wonderful place to get more of an introduction to these records. Also, there are some guides there as well. A wealth of information here as it pertains to those records. This is another great source, Mapping the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, this is a great source of information to understand the Bureau of Field Offices, has wonderful information that where you can actually, as I mentioned, understand uh, the resources before you begin to kind of die, delve in. Um, and of course, there are state records. There are Virginia Field, Freeman's Bureau Field Office records that are on family search. And um, I've been delving into these recently and we have wonderful conversations in our Freedom Bureau Fridays group. If Shelly, if you're here, please uh, enter that link, um, enter that information. And we, uh, we have some wonderful conversations about the records um, with the Freedom Bureau field office, uh, particularly in Virginia. Most recently, I was able to further break past that uh, what, what, what some would call 1870 brick wall 
Um, I don't necessarily see it as that, but I'll explain more about that in another presentation. But I was able to tap into the Arkansas Freedmen Bureau um, office records and I tapped into their register of marriages and I immediately found my great, 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 great grandfather uh, listed, but his name was different. His name was Edward um, here and which was, I discovered was short for Ned. Um, and I found his wife and I also see a, a lot of information here. I also see that he was previously married and the reasons uh, for his separation, for the separations are listed. Um, I also saw that his wife was previously married and um, gained a bit of information regarding her separation, which she listed as being sold. Um, I don't know whether she was sold, whether she was sold or her spouse was sold, but again, this is some critical information for me as I begin to, to move even de deeper into understanding more about our um, family history in terms of um, the enslaved era. Military records. Military records uh, were, have been a, a wonderful source, particularly as I began to focus on the siblings of my great-great-grandfather. Um, this is the National Archives and Records. Um, their site, which uh, has a wonderful source of resources, you can also find resources, uh, uh, military records on Ancestry. I actually obtained this off of Ancestry when I began to inter I began to research my great great grandfather's siblings, and I found this World War One draft registration card, which gives a lot of detail. Um, it even tells the it gives a, the physical description, which is another which is another critical piece of information as you begin to build the story and learn more about your ancestors. Um, so this is a vital, a, a wonderful source of information that also um, tells me his occupation. Well, a bit about his occupation, where he worked, um, Pennsylvania Lumber Company. So usually, when I see that type of um, that type of information, I delve a little deeper into the local history, and I want to know. Um, what was Pennsylvania Lumber Company? Uh, was the company? I want to know all that I can know about that particular um, that particular place. So I delve deeper into to the local history when I find those types of details. Okay. And this is just a, a screenshot from Ancestry.com to show you that they have some wonderful resources there as it relates to um, military history military records. Historic Black cemeteries. Again, this is another great source for genealogy research as it pertains to African Americans. Um, I've been involved in cemetery preservation for quite some time, and this is Haven's Arrest Cemetery in Little Rock, Arkansas. And so the cemeteries give us a lot of story, a history about that community. In this particular case, I began to learn about a hospital that was uh, named after a particular woman, as you see here, her name is Lena Lowe Jordan. I also pay attention when I'm visiting cemeteries to uh, the emblems that are on the tombstones. And I see that these two um, persons were, uh, had either a policy from the Mosaic Templars of America, which was a life insurance company um, that existed in Little Rock, Arkansas in the late uh, 19th century to the early 20th century. And so historic cemeteries, black cemeteries are a wealth of knowledge as it pertains to um, African-American genealogy research. And it tells you a lot about the social history of that particular region. As I mentioned earlier, um, historic black newspapers are an absolutely wonderful source. I use them often um, because they tell us all types of details about um, African-Americans in, in a particular community. I've seen uh, newspaper, uh, articles that said, you know, Mrs. Jackson went to visit her sister who was ill in Ohio, all types of information just about the lives of, of African American people was featured in those particular newspapers and they're a wonderful source. Cindy's list is another great source. Um, this is, um, it links, it points you to a geneal genealogy resources that are available online. I use this quite often, it's updated quite a bit every day, um, and not every day, but quite often I see where updates are made um, on Cindy's list. And this is a wonderful source where you can tap into all manner of sources that are available online. So as we kind of transition to the other part of, of my, uh, this presentation, um, which we're dealing with a little bit with slave era research, but also I'm gonna share some of the findings 
um, that I things that I found from the Lemon Project or for the Lemon Project. And as I approach slave era research, I often think of it um, like a patch quilt, as what I call a patch quilt theory, in that we don't always find the information about the persons who were enslaved. Um, but every piece of information that we find is very, very critical and speaks to the broader narrative of a community. Um, and so whether it's um, listed that they were unknown, that to me is a, is a very vital piece of information. All the information that we collect on any individual is critical to the narrative. And so slave era resources, and I won't delve for very long because I know that um, this workshop is kind of introductory, um, but I do want and I give you some uh, information on slave era resources. Um, bills of sales, um, tax records, wills, land records, family papers, diaries are very, very critical, particularly um, with the type of research that I'm doing. Um, historic newspapers, again, Freeman Bureau reports, runaway slave ads, church records for missionary societies, and also sometimes a simple Google search can lead you to um, some wonderful sources of information. Um, here recently, I have been using the Virginia Slave Birth Index, um, and it's from 1853 to 1866, and I and it's actually on FamilySearch, a great source of information, um, and it's also a finding aid. And really, uh, to educate myself about the records, I usually go to this wiki, research wiki that's on uh, Family Research. They have these for most of the record sets that are there, and this is a vital wonderful piece of information that you can use to actually educate yourself about the information that is about the resources that are in that collection. And this is an example of a slave birth index. Okay. And this is a bill of sale um, that I pulled from an archive at Duke University Special Collections Online. Um, they have quite a, a good collection as it relates to um, uh, documents pertaining to American slavery. Um, geography of slavery in Virginia. This has become a great source as I began to identify those in our list who were runaway slaves. Um, and I found quite a few um, runaway slave ads. And this is one example of uh, a runaway slave ad for a man in our list who was owned by one of our board of visitors. Um, but it also gives a description of this person, a physical description. And um, as you can see, it says his face is marked. Um, as the Gold Coast slaves generally are. And so these bits of information are, are really, really critical as we kind of build the narrative of enslaved persons um, that we're researching. And also tells me the county. So there's a lot of great information uh, that could lead me to other sources. Uh, this is a wonderful source, um, unknown no longer, a database at the of Virginia slave names. And I use this quite a bit as well in my research of persons enslaved. Okay. And this is a, a research project that I've, I've been working on here recently uh, about the life of Samuel Harris, who was a formerly enslaved person um, who found success in the dry goods business, uh, dry goods industry. And it is said that he contributed in some manner financially uh, to William and Mary. So we're still researching that. But I was really interested in, in him because it shows a person who was enslaved, but he, had, he has made and he has remade his life in this very um, a brutal system and very uh, an environment that's very harsh, but he has built his wealth that is comparable to Macy's as this article that I found in newspapers.com, which is a wonderful source. Um, I encourage you to, to use this source. It's actually free for students at William and Mary, um, but this is a treasure trove of information. And if you don't have a subscription, I will tell you that it's the best $70 that you would actually pay. Um, and it's a, a wonderful source, particularly as you begin to to delve into the research of your family and community. Um, National Negro Business League, as I began to delve deeper into his life, I just realized that he would probably have been a member of the record of the National Negro Business League. Um, and so I actually did find him in the records listed um, there, which gave us further information about his life and his business. Um, also, I also discovered that he had a son who was a physician in in Williamsburg using uh, newspapers.com. Um, Harvard educated um, and just a wonderful person. And this is just testament that even with the struggles that African-Americans are making and remaking their lives, 
in very hard circumstances, then this is the legacy and information that we want to, to pass along to future generations. So what's next in terms of our, um, as it relates to genealogy workshops? Um, 2021, Black history theme, as I mentioned, the Black family representation, identity, and diversity. Um, in keeping with this um, theme of Black history, I encourage you to delve deeper in your family history research using your family history, using the tools that I've shared with you this evening. Decide what you want to discover. Um, search and develop your own personal family archive. Develop a research plan, get organized, and then dive into the records. Because as I often say that finding our people and writing our own narratives, writing ourselves into history is a revolutionary act. And I told you I would share more information about uh, the exciting workshop that we have coming up in April. We're gonna delve deeper into genealogy and we're gonna look at take as, as this um, advertisement notes, we're gonna take a deeper look into genealogy records with our friends from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, Ms. Hannah Scruggs, who is a, a William & Mary alum, as well as Lisa Crawley. And they're gonna delve deeper into, into some of the records that I've discussed today and even more. So we look forward to seeing you there. And this is my information. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. We're gonna have a short question and answer session and uh, where I'll be happy to, to answer as many questions as possible. But if you have any questions that we're unable to answer tonight, you can feel free to, um, to email me at jsjohnson02 at wm.edu. Thank you so much. I appreciate you for joining me. Um, Dr. Johnson, we have um, a couple questions um, we can start with. Um, the first is basically, um, after doing this work and gathering this information, why um, should I share and entrust it to someone else? We are still trying to recover from the mistrust of the past. How does it benefit the stakeholder community to give away what binds us together? Hmm. That's a definitely a valid point. And um, it's a situation that I've been placed in. I've done recent projects such as the Lemon Project um, with several communities. And th that is always the question um, because of these strained relationships that have happened over time. People wanna know why should I give my information and holding back, that's definitely understandable. Um, but I try to look at it and, and I'm not in a position to tell anyone what to do with their information and their research. Um, but I think we all benefit when it's in a larger forum. Um, and that's why I encourage um, this collaboration. And I understand that it, it takes time for trust to be built. Um, I know I'm not gonna just readily give my family information to, um, to any institution where, we, where there has been some, some strain. And so I can definitely understand that, that distrust, but I also understand that it's a, a story that is, that is important for, and it's an important con contribution for, uh, on a larger scale. And so while I'm in no position to tell anyone what to do with their research and their family histories and stories and whatnot, um, I just say, I do believe that everyone ultimately benefits when the stories are told, when the full and narratives are shared. Okay. Um, Ms. Miller, um, your hand, um, did you have another question? I don't know if it was a question, but I was going to say, uh, don't disregard information that you find because it doesn't appear to fit mm -hmm. with what you have perceived. Yes. <laughs> I, I was getting DNA matches and it turns out that somehow or another, my dad's folks in Georgia are related to my mom's folks in Virginia. And I just kept going, oh, that can't be right. That can't be right, but it is. Mm -hmm. And Jody, back, back to the question that I was asked, asked earlier, um, I also want to, I want to mention that in the summertime, we're going to be doing a series of, of workshops um, and where I'm encouraged, where I'm hoping to develop a cohort of community researchers who are willing um, 
take advantage of the resources and you can use them however you choose. I'm hoping that some will be willing to share more about their the family stories in a larger forum. Um, again, we want to set the record straight in many ways. And if we withhold the information, um, you can't really adequately set it straight. And so, and so I think that's another uh, reason why I would choose to share is that I understand the historical erasures and the only way to correct that is if we bring the information to bear. Um, another question, are you aware that employees in courthouses and libraries have at times blocked the finding of historical information? Absolutely, that's why I mentioned earlier, records that are concealed or information or access. I, I definitely do believe that that has happened. I think it also happens with, with family papers. There's certain information people don't want to be publicized. And I think those um, enslavers and, and their descendants, I think they were very conscious of protecting the reputations of their families. And so I think that there is much information that may not be there and that those who have held positions of power or what have you, they have uh, concealed records or destroyed records. I think profoundly that has happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you advise the tools like ancestry DNA, um, or do you find them generally unhelpful? Yeah. Well, I think that just depends on the person. I, I have not done the DNA. Um, I have a friend of mine um, that is a recognized, an internationally recognized uh, genealogist uh, who initially in the earlier years really kind of discouraged it. I think it has something to do with the DNA samples and whatnot. Um, but again, it's, it's based on your own um, personal reasons. I kind of leave that to the individual. It's something that I've not taken advantage of. I'm just not really sold on the idea at the moment of giving someone $500 to, <laughs> to obtain this information or however much it costs. Um, because I understand that there's some information that's never going to be known. And I also understand that, that companies play off of that, right? Um, and exploit that. And so, because we ultimately have a desire to understand more deeply our ancestral connections. And, I, and I've and i seen over time where that has been exploited. Um, and so I'm a little cautious of these um, tests and whatnot that's gonna tell me the exact tribe of which I came from or I'm linked to or what have you. Uh, but that's just my own skepticism. <laughs> Any other questions? And I thank you all so much for listing uh, your reasons uh, for research, um, your research interest um, in the chat. And I'll make a note of this. We'll make a note of this as we move forward and we plan future uh, genealogy workshops. I will say just, I have not done the ancestry either, but two of my cousins have, mm -hmm. and they found, a, um, come across a lot of family members. Um, it's, it's helped them in, in, so, and they didn't pay. I don't think ancestry is anything near 500, but I think some of the more, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I don't know what, the more complicated ones, the more ones that give you a little bit more detail, they are more expensive. But and I think actually one cousin did go that route, but the other one just um, has been doing and you know. Um, yeah, someone said seven dollars. Hmm. Okay. So listed like seven dollars or forty nine dollars for DNA test. Yeah, they and they usually have sales at the holidays, so mm -hmm. I just haven't done it yet, but. Um, yeah, and that's not my area of expertise, DNA, but, yeah. <laughs> but there's some people with some more wonderful information about it. Um, and so um, perhaps we'll bring that into this fold of our genealogy workshop discussions. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. Uh, we, I've been doing this for a while and I've gone back to uh, 1866 and I can identify for my great grandfather was born in Virginia, but 
but I can't find any information. Is there, where you, would you suggest that I go from there? So you're trying to go further back from 1866, are you? Uh-huh. My and, great grandfather was born in 1866, and I've been able to transfer, you know, track the family up to that, from that time up. Is your family located in Virginia? Uh, we started in Virginia. Okay. <laughs> and you're finding the records, the records that you have found, was this person living in this state? Yeah, I found these. In, in, in the 18, uh, what's it, census, 1910 census, I show him and his children. But uh, ancestry shows that he was born about 1866, and they say Virginia. And then it lists on, it tells about his marriage, uh, his, and lists all of his children. And I was just wondering if there's a possibility I could go back even further. Well, you should be able to go back a bit further. It seems that you're he was a short born shortly after the Civil War. So there may be some records in terms of, are you finding ever that, well, I'm sure his parents were enslaved. Um, so you may be able to look at some records. Sorry, I was getting an interruption there. Mm -hmm. I would like to know a bit more about um, the locale. I would kind of start locally. I know I did with my relatives. I went to the, I went to the county uh, historical local historical society and began to delve into some records there in the local courthouses as well. And that gave me some information um, on some enslaved ancestors that I was looking for. But I would like to know a bit more information in terms of the locale. Um, perhaps we can follow up after this. Is that, is that okay? That'd be fine. Then I can connect and we can kind of talk through some different options that you may have, different records that may assist you. Yeah, because uh, I'm, I'm from originally from Suffolk, Virginia, okay. and uh, the county courthouse was burnt three different occasions, okay. so the records have been destroyed. So they, uh, they can't find anything in there. And through discussions with some family members, they say that my great great grandfather was born in Barbados mm -hmm. and shipped to West Virginia. But then this ancestry says he was born in, in Virginia. So I'm just really confused. Mm -hmm. But it lists all his children, mm -hmm. my great uncles and, and things. So I'm just really not sure. But I can't go back to 1866. Well, I would like to consult with you directly on that. If okay. you have to connect following this. And Can I come too? That's my cousin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to yes, please. <laughs> you have my, is that Shondell? Yes. Okay, you see my email listed, right? Let's let's connect. And this is Carnese. I'm part of the family too. <laughs> okay. Well, this is my email address. Let's further connect. Oh, I'm sorry. And have a conversation about this. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate also, it. Also, there was a suggestion that you join the local um, chapter of the Afro American. Afro-American Afro Historical and Genealogical Society. I'm a member of that group as well. You should join. Okay. But I'm placing my information here in the chat. And I put my email on there too. I, I have a start to a question and I'll just put my email information on it. And we can further visit. Okay. Okay. Any other questions, comments? And as mentioned, even if I don't get to your question, then I'm going to have another workshop in April. And in between then, I'll be able to take some questions and uh, via email and, and provide you some information. Um, and there'll be later workshops as well where you can actually, um, we can delve a little bit deeper into some of your questions. And Dr. Johnson, someone has asked about um, uh, getting access, a, a list of the uh, resources that you mentioned in the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And is that pretty much the same list that you, you, you made for my students? Well, I can share it. You can share that list. There's probably more there than they want to know, but, <laughs> there's not. but you can share that list as well. I do have a list of resources of, of all of the links that are mentioned in the PowerPoint. I do have that list and I'll be happy to share that. 
Dr. Johnson. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for a great talk. <laughs> it's Renata hey. Uh, Sanders. Hey, I've been trying to uh, make myself not say this, <laughs> but I, I'm led to say it uh, when you okay. set up your call with Mr. Good and his family. Go ahead and send me the link and I'll uh, see if I can come in and, and give you guys a little support also. I appreciate that. Thank no you. Thank you. Um, Renata Sanders is a member of, of OGS as well, and she's been a, a, a wonderful connection uh, for me here since I've relocated to uh, Central Virginia and uh, a wealth of knowledge and will potentially be doing a talk with us this summer. So stay tuned. Well, I found your presentation to be very informative. I'm glad you found it to be helpful and I look forward to further talking to you. So we're, we're at the magic hour, um, but I'm so glad that we've, um, we've been wanting to do this with the Lemon Project for at least 10 years. Um, we've been wanting to be able to offer this type of service and because of the um, Mellon Grant, um, we're, um, we're now able to do it. So I'm very um, happy to see so many of you and please we, we look forward to seeing you in April and, uh, and during the summer. So thank you um, again for coming out and we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Good. I'll talk to you soon.